Live and we're about stream. to go live to the world, so there'll be a short pause and then we'll be live. There'll be a short pause and then we'll be live, so behave yourselves. <laughs> Wait, all the chairs, don't take all the chairs, I'll feel even lonelier. <laughs> now I'm stuck with this one. Damn it. What the? Sure, maybe, maybe someone will come and join me. All alone. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I didn't want to go. We didn't talk. We'll talk. We'll talk. Oh, we'll talk. Okay. How are you? I'm I good. Microphone. So from the theater, I shall project, and you will hear every word I say. I may not emote it, but you'll hear it. Oh, all right then. He stayed. He was like, that's no help. This is no help. That's not a microphone. <laughs> this is. Oh, yeah, yes, that is a microphone. Uh, see, the difference between a professional actor, a professional actor, and a professional auditioner. Actor, auditioner. This is a microphone to an auditioner. And, and, and this is a microphone <laughs> to an actor. It, it really is a microphone. I really am an actor. <laughs> you have cleared up so much for me just in the short time you've been here. Thank yes, you. Yes, having, uh, having functioned as a, where is the microphone? Because I cannot talk any longer. This is a hint. Uh, uh, <laughs> Are you getting the hook? Yes, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I guess I am. Oh, I'm, golly. I've been disinvited. No, I, I'll be right back. Uh, okay. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> he looks so different. <laughs> <Not the laughs> Hi, guys. Are we live yet? Yes, we're live? We're live. Hi, world. Welcome to the live stream. Here's everybody. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Amanda Tapping. Um, <laughs> it's just a name. It's just a name. That's mine. Uh, uh, I played Samantha Carter for 11 years on Stargate SG-1 and Stargate Atlantis and a couple of movies. And then I went on to do a show called Sanctuary, which, yeah. That's pretty cool. Uh, and then I guess my next major gig was a show called, a little show that's uh, little, called Supernatural. Yeah. And <laughs> where I played a character for the first time that everyone hated, which was weird. Uh, and now I'm really mostly a director of uh, some of hopefully your favorite shows, like uh, Travelers and uh, Supernatural. Uh, the 100 coming up, Siren. Has anyone seen Siren, the show about mermaids? Right on, hey? They're very lovely people, the mermaids. Um, oh, no, the whole, the whole cast. Um, uh, uh, what else have I done? X Company. Did anyone see X Company? Yeah. Anne with an E. And yeah. Love that show. Uh, yeah, a whole bunch of stuff. Primeval. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to list my resume, but I don't know why. Anyway, you guys, IMDB me. You might, you might learn something. I might learn something. Um, uh, I'm super happy to be here uh, because it's been a while since I've done a GateCon, and it's here in my hometown, which is crazy. So I'm very happy, and I'm so happy that there are so many of you here, which is pretty awesome. Um, I guess I'm going to open it up to questions, and it's people from around the world here, which is so cool. Hi, guys. Uh, Oh, what I will do, actually quickly before we get the whole uh, Q&A rolling, is um, just tell you briefly about Sanctuary for Kids, for those of you that don't know about it. It's a charity that I started with Damien Kindler and Jill Bodie uh, 10 years ago. And um, we've raised over a million dollars in the course of the decade. Yeah. Through entirely through uh, the generosity of this fandom. And you were saying, uh, just before about what makes Stargate fans so unique. 
And I think that there is, uh, there is something very different about this fandom. I think there's a collective generosity and a connection that people make with each other. There's a kindness that you don't always see in other fandoms. And uh, I don't know why we're so lucky to have this collective experience. The show was a great big family, but it also feels like the fandom is a great big family, which is really wonderful. So Sanctuary for Kids really was a result of tapping into that aspect of the fandom and the incredible generosity. Uh, we support um, organizations mostly in Nepal right now and locally. Uh, Nepal Orphans Home, Next Generation Nepal, which helps traffic children. Uh, Ash in Nepal, which takes women who have been trafficked into sexual slavery out of those hor horrific situations and we try to um, help them build new lives. Uh, by we, I mean Ash and Nepal, we just support them. But all amazing organizations, Watari Foundation here in Vancouver, which helps kids on the downtown east side of Vancouver. Um, anyway, we've raised over a million dollars and uh, it's heartbreaking, yeah. Yeah, thanks, <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's heartbreaking to actually say this, but we are closing our doors at the end of this year. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> it got wobbly. Um, for a lot of good reasons, uh, but um, essentially I will continue my charity work. I will continue to work with the organizations that we work with as an individual and hope that you will continue to support them individually. Uh, and then I'm just looking for my next uh, venture, whatever that may be. But I wanted to say thank you so much. Uh, we're still driving to, you know, fill up the coffers before we close our doors and then we'll distribute all of the funds. Um, the thing with Sanctuary for Kids is a dollar is a dollar is a dollar. We pay the overhead and the administration and uh, you give us a dollar, the dollar goes to the charity. And the charities we work with have very, very low overhead, so the money goes directly to the people who need it most. So that's something that we're really proud of. Um, so yeah. So check us out. Uh, sanctuaryforkids.org and uh, if you feel so inclined you got till December to uh, do something fantastic. Okay that's it about Sanctuary for Kids but thank you so much for your uh, support for the last decade. Decade? What? <laughs> but we're all so young. How is that possible that a decade? What? Stargate started in 1997. <laughs> yeah. I f that doesn't make any sense to me. We were talking in the green room about the fact that that was like 21 years ago. And how is that even possible since we haven't aged at all? <laughs> <laughs> Much. Uh, anyway, okay, so does anyone have any questions they would? Oh, golly. How do, you, how do you really feel about the question in the back? How do you really feel about Pete Shanahan? And I'm, I am no biased, it's okay. Amanda Tapping loves Pete Shanahan. Wait a minute, I don't like how this has started. <laughs> okay, go ahead. And David Deloey. Oh, okay, good. The ca he was the actor who played Pete Shanahan. Oh. Yeah, his name oh. is David DeLuise. Oh, is he related to Peter DeLuise? He is related. He's Peter DeLuise's brother. Oh, handsome younger brother is handsome. what I heard. Handsome fellow. Good, uh, good gene pool. Very nice. much so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So did you like, was he your favorite uh, boyfriend on the show? Oh, yeah. You know what? Because um, I wasn't allowed to date the guy I was really in love with, so. Oh! What? You know what? That. Go. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I, I, she did. Sam loved Pete. She really wanted to look outside of the Stargate world and find some normalcy, and she loved him. <laughs> Just not enough. The time that Pete had was lucky. Sam felt lucky too, Pete. It's 
so funny what just comes out of your head sometimes. <laughs> oh, truth. <laughs> Hi. Where am I looking? Hello. Hi. Right here. Hi. Um, yeah, my question kind of ties in with all of this conversation you're just having. Uh, there's been a lot of talk amongst the boys this weekend of who you preferred kissing. So we're just wondering <laughs> who was the best kisser, David, JR, or RDA? <laughs> and think about who's in the room. <laughs> wow. I'm going to start by saying they all pale in comparison to my husband, Alan. <laughs> He sets a, a very high benchmark, but um, KJR and I didn't really make out that much. Uh, <laughs> Garwin Sanford was a lovely sweet kiss. You didn't mention him, but I'm going to. Uh, wow, David and, David and Rick. <laughs> Do I have to choose? Oh. Oh. I think Rick, because uh, the anticipation was so strong. I, I mean, Jack and Sam's anticipation was so strong. <laughs> so, you know, as a professional actor, you have to play that anticipation with your fellow actor. Uh, you can tell because I have a real microphone. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I think the anticipation of that, and so therefore the fulfillment of that anticipation made it quite sweet. But David DeLuise is a hell of a kisser, I gotta say. <laughs> How's that for a non-answer answer? <laughs> oh, oh. Hello, Miss Cowan. Hi, Amanda. Uh, can you tell us whether or not you directed yourself in any of the new Travelers episodes? Have I, have I directed, directed myself? Directed yourself, yeah. No, I didn't, did I? No, I didn't have to direct myself in Travelers, I don't think. I directed nine episodes so far of the three seasons. No, I didn't. <laughs> Damn. That's so funny, maybe I did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Action. What? <laughs> Cut. What? I did. Oh my gosh, I did. Oh. Wow. I had to think because I did four episodes this season and they were all pretty crazy. Yes, I did. You know how I remember that? Because one of the episodes was titled Perot. And that's the character that I played on Travelers. And so I got the script and I went, Perot? What? Crap, I have to direct myself. I'm so difficult. How am I going to do it? <laughs> How will I get myself out of my trailer? Um, <laughs> but the thing with, uh, the thing with um, Travelers, and in any established TV series, but Travelers uh, in particular, um, is that the crew is, is so well gelled at this point, and they're so supportive of each other and supportive of the directors and... Uh, Eric, of course, directs shows that, you know, he's the lead, so he directs himself as well. Um, he directed me as well. Eric directed me, and I had to direct him, so that was fun. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I did have to direct myself. <laughs> I completely forgot, and now it's all coming back to me. When I was lying on this cold concrete floor, and I said, why aren't I using a stand-in? Well, I should be <laughs> I'm an idiot. Uh, anyway, yeah, I did have to direct myself. It was fun. It's a gr I love Travelers. I love the mythology of the show. Of course, it's Brad Wright, so it's brilliant and, and many layers to it and uh, just so well executed. And uh, I love the characters and the development between the characters. Um, and I love the actors. They're great actors. I'm starting at the top, of course, with Eric McCormick, who sets the benchmark for how everyone else acts. And then you've got this cast of very young actors, and he has set the tone. And so they're beautiful, professional, wonderful, talented people. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, so watch it if you haven't. It's on Netflix. I don't know if you've heard of Netflix, but it's on it. Hi. Hi. Um, Hi. To just kind of follow up, one of my very favorite episodes that you have directed 
um, is 17 minutes oh, from, golly. and I was just curious how you had to shoot that, if you had to come up with all of those different shots or, or whatnot, but I thought it was executed wonderfully. Thank you. I think that that was logistically the hardest episode of television I've ever done. So for those of you who haven't seen it, are there people who haven't seen 17 Minutes of Travelers? It's, uh, it's a time loop. So, uh, and there's basically two concurrent stories that keep getting caught into this time loop, and they do connect at the end. But it's basically, uh, we have a skydiver trying to come down and, and save the travelers who are on the beach who are about to get attacked. And so, both these timelines keep playing out over and over again. So first of all, it was all this stuff on the beach. And uh, Brad said to me, you know, you have to make it look slightly different each loop. You can't use the same shots. And I was like, no, of course not. But it was trying to find ways to make each one look different and have little tells in there. Uh, the beach was one thing. And that was, and we had, you know, people in the water with cameras. We had all sorts of crazy stuff going on on the beach. But the skydiving is the thing that I'm perhaps the most proud of. Because what I did was uh, I had two skydiving stunt doubles and a skydiving camera guy. And uh, I got a big room at the studio, and we rehearsed each jump. And I gave them each a shot list. So they had GoPros on their heads, GoPros on their chests. Uh, we were able to change the lenses on the GoPros. They did six jumps in total, and each jump had a different order for who came out of the plane. Each jump I had, like, I want you to get the plane floating away with the sun behind them as they fall through the sky, and then you're gonna get that detail of trying to pull his parachute and um, so we had to and we practiced in this room the six jumps and where they would land and where the camera guy would be and of course then you put them up in a plane in the air and they have to fall out of a plane and try to find those positions they were phenomenal they were truly amazing and we were very lucky that we got a private airfield uh, in Langley and a plane and so the plane was able to land on the private airstrip take off again and redo each jump but then I had actors on the ground for, you know, when one of the skydivers falls to his death, and I really wanted to capture the real skydiver sister landing in the same shot as the actor who's... So that was like, that's asking a skydiver to fall from 10,000 feet and land on a, you know, grain of rice. And she did it. And it was really funny because the camera operator because we had to shoot at second unit, so it was like, oh my gosh, we've got this new crew, and uh, I literally grabbed the camera at one point and went, got it, boom, and she landed, and it was fantastic. Uh, you know, and then we had the dogs coming out of the truck attacking her, and I had to put a GoPro on her for the dog and the bite and, the, and getting those dogs. There was a biting dog and a barking dog. We had two dogs. <laughs> and I couldn't tell them apart, except that one barked and one bit, so that, I guess that was a good <laughs> clue. But there was, the logistics were crazy. The truck who almost hits her, you know, that big, huge semi coming down the road. And we did that with a VisiFX split screen so that we, you know, didn't have an actor standing in front of an 18-wheeler. Uh, so the, just the logistics. And we stayed out in the park. We were in Golden Ears Park. And we stayed out there as a crew because it was just too far to travel each day. And we shot Monday to Friday in this park. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it poured buckets of rain. Like, poured. Tuesday, Thursday, it was sunny. <laughs> and it happened that we had scheduled the beach on the Tuesday, so that was good. But there were scenes, and Brad phoned me one day, and he goes, the dailies look phenomenal. How are we going to get them to, and I was like, it's, I don't know. <laughs> good luck. Anyway, I think it worked out well. But then, for the skydiving with the actors, uh, on our very last day of shooting, again, second unit, had a cove green screen and a parallelogram, so I put the actors up on this, like, lift, that went up and down like this and moved around. It was this big arm that they were on. And then I had a techno crane so I could make the techno crane go all around their faces. Um, and that kind of thing, like I'd never done anything like that. So that was super cool in this little 30 foot techno crane, this little studio with the actors. And of course we had to get them off because the parallelogram is super uncomfortable. And, and it was, you know, like they're being lifted all over the place. So, and then just meshing all of that together and then the magic of our VisFX team uh, making it work. It was a logistical conundrum, and I loved it. And it was the episode that people either loved for the technicality of it or hated it. Uh, but for me, it was just, a, it was an incredible challenge. And I remember I called Brad almost every night. 
when I was, as soon as I got out of the park and could get a phone signal, I was like, okay, Brad, we do this, we do this, we do this. Anyway, I'm really happy. Okay, bye. <laughs> I think he thought I was rare. But yeah, thank you for mentioning that. It was a very challenging episode, but I loved it. Yeah. So Hi. piggybacking. Hey. Hi. <laughs> So kind of piggybacking a little bit on that, um, I actually have a daughter of mine who is interested in being a stunt double. And so from both an actor's perspective and a director's perspective, what is it that you are looking for in uh, a really good stunt double? A really great stunt double studies the actor that they're stunting to get any sort of nuance or you know, particular ways that an actor might move. Um, so that from any angle, there, every person has idiosyncrasies in, in terms of how they move through this world. And a good stunt double studies that, watches that actor, watches how they land, watches how they stand, how their feet land when they're, you know, when they jump or any, any of those things. So that's one thing that I think is super important. Uh, massive amounts of courage <laughs> is a good thing too. Uh, yeah, um, and, and obviously, you know, just being physically nimble. I don't even think it's so much about strength as it is about being nimble and flexible. And I mean, my stunt doubles on Stargate, uh, one of them, my first one, Kim Shepard, didn't really look like me at all. She was shorter and we just, did, we had completely different bodies, but she watched me and she watched how I moved and she picked up on it and it was great. So that kind of thing I think is super important. Hello. Whoop, is it on? Uh oh. Hello. Yeah. Um, I um, I know you do a lot of directing work up here, and I really like the stuff you did in, in X Company in particular, and even Arctic Air and Van Helsing. Are we ever going to see you do Murdoch Mysteries? You know what? I would love to have done Murdoch Mysteries, and in fact, I directed a short film on their set. Uh, so I was like sneaking around their set, looking at stuff. It would have been great fun, but yeah, no, I never got the opportunity to do that. Um, and I try not to shoot out of town because I have a daughter uh, who just turned 13. So I'm, I've done Dark Matter out there, of course, with Joe and Paul, which I, you know, would crawl over broken glass for them. So that was a no-brainer. And with an E out there, X Company was so specific because it was Budapest and it was like just a singular amazing experience for two seasons. Um, and I'm going to New York. Uh, in March to direct um, Blind Spot. Yeah. I know. I was super freaked out. Like, they got this call from my agent who said, NBC, and they've called to see if you're available for Blind Spot. I was like, what? Yes. <laughs> when is it? I don't care. Yes. Um, but no, I've never, I never got asked to do Murdoch Mysteries. BS, but yeah, it would have been fun. My daughter loves that show. My mom and my daughter watch that show together. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, of curiosity, what was the origin of Stuck on a Glacier with MacGyver? <laughs> that, uh, it's, it's so funny now because it's sort of become canon for the series in a way, like it's such a big part of that first season, but we were shooting in a refrigerated studio. It was like minus two, we had real ice, the crew was freezing, everyone was in the Arctic jackets, uh, and we had to keep the studio refrigerated to keep the ice from melting. And Martin Wood said to me, look, if you have any chance to have fun, just go for it, and I was like, like what? And he goes, just, you know, the crew could use a good laugh. Just whatever. And it just presented itself in this moment when Rick was like crawling up towards me with the knife and, the, and then crawling up and he was like so earnest and he was, I don't want to say emoting, but he was acting like crazy, you know, just, ugh. And it just, it came out kind of like what I just said to David DeLuise, it just came out. And <laughs> Uh, and it just, yeah, do you think we can make it out? And all of a sudden, this like other voice inside my head went, you think we can make it out? What, you're, 
Got a belt buckle, a shoelace, a stick of gum. You're fucking MacGyver. Build a nuclear reactor. Oh, I swore. Uh, and then, because it felt so good to say that, you know, build us a nuclear reactor for crying out loud. And then it, this, it just kept going. You used to be MacGyver, McGadget, McGimmick. Now you're Mr. McUseless. And that's literally how it happened, these words. And then it was finally, and now you're make useless. And then as soon as useless fell out of my mouth, I went, oh, I'm probably gonna be fired. <laughs> the crew burst out laughing, so the mission accomplished. <laughs> I followed my mission orders, <laughs> and I accomplished the mission. But then afterwards it was like, because Rick was so blindsided. And I was kind of blindsided by the words that came out of my mouth. I was like, what? Why did I say make useless? What was I laughing? That at the lunch line afterwards, I was like, we're good, right? <laughs> we're good. But, yeah. Anyway, I guess, I guess it was okay because I stuck around for a little while. <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was Martin Wood just saying, have some fun. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Amanda, many of us are fans of all of your work, of course. Um, I can't tell if you're actually um, going to be in next year's uh, Supernatural, but I, my question is, what would be the comparisons between the 200th episode of Stargate SG-1 and Supernatural's 300th episode, which is coming up? Sorry, okay. can you ask that again, because you got a little quiet. The difference um, between... Well, I'm asking uh, whether you're involved with the Sam and Dean th you know, Supernatural show next year or not. I was just asking, what would be your parallels? What, what parallels would you draw between the 200th episode of SG-1 and, of course, Supernatural going into the 300th episode, um, I don't know, in three, six months, whatever it is? I think what, um, what I've noticed with episodes that reach that kind of number, 100, 200, and now... Supernatural 300 is that they try to create an element of fun. Those episodes are about the fans in a lot of ways, more so than they are about the canon of the series, although they are. But it's really about, it's, uh, those episodes feel to me like a, a big thank you present to the fans. Like, you've got us to 200 episodes, this one's for you. We're going to make fun in Stargate, of course, of all the different things that we've made fun of over the years, but we're gonna shine a light on them, or all the things that people have said about the show, we're gonna shine a light on it, and thank you very much. And that's what those shows feel like, and Supernatural is no different. I mean, they have a very similar vibe on their set to Stargate. It's so fun on that show. Um, it's fun to act on that show. It's super fun to direct that show, uh, because the guys are just so wonderful in the crew. A lot of them have been there for the same amount of time. Like, you know, like Stargate, a lot of our crew stayed for the entire run of the series. And it's the same thing on Supernatural. So those kind of episodes, and I hope I'm answering your question correctly, but those kind of episodes feel to me like just a big uh, thank you gift to the fans. And that's, I think, the intention when a show gets to that kind of number. That's what it should be. So it feels like Supernatural definitely does the same thing. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, so many of the cast and crew from Stargate has then gone on and worked in Sanctuary, and now they seem to be going in Travelers. We've seen a lot of them in Eureka and all of these things. Has that been intentional or just actor pool, or you guys all just following each other around? <laughs> <laughs> we just call each other up. What are you going on to what? What? Okay, I'll get on. Uh, it is partly the nature of the small relatively small industry that we have here in Vancouver. I mean, we shoot a ton of shows here, but it is a small pool and you keep seeing each other. But certainly with, you know, with Sanctuary, for example, we mined the wonderful relationships and friendships and talent that we had on Stargate. You know, bringing Chris Heyerdahl and bringing, like, it was just, it would be crazy not to take advantage of knowing that you've got, uh, using Chris Heyerdahl as an example, an amazing actor, a great guy, somebody who's going to be fun to work with, somebody who's going to deliver an amazing performance, or in his case, too, you know, simultaneously amazing performances, um, that you tap into that because it's a known entity. So it just, it kind of happens, you know, and then, uh, and now, of course, uh, Hallmark has a huge following, uh, or a huge base up here in terms of production. 
So you know, you see a lot of those actors going through the same Hallmark thing, and it's the same with sci-fi. And a lot of you know, Terrell does a lot of uh, Hallmark stuff. And Terrell, by the way, is really sick. Yeah, no, for real. And she is devastated that she's not here. So I wanted to do a shout out from her. She sends you her love. We just texted before I came on stage and we were texting all day yesterday and she was like, oh man, I'm so sick. She never misses work. Like This is a girl who never misses work and she missed a day of shooting and she has to shoot tomorrow. She's contagious, so she's like, it would take con crud to a whole new level. <laughs> uh, but just, sorry to segue, but it just made me think of Tito and she just sends you her love and she's really, really devastated that she's not here this weekend, just in case you were wondering. Anyway. So love from Terrell. Uh, but yeah, love to Terrell. I will send that. Thank you. Hi. Good morning. I was just wondering, this might be a quick question, I'm hoping. Why was there only four, were there only four seasons of Sanctuary? Oh. I thought that was phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I yeah. Again, another devastating aspect of the industry. So Sanctuary, and really quickly in a nutshell, was uh, I think probably one of the only independently financed television series uh, at the time. I don't know if there are any now, but we were privately financed by a corporation. Uh, we did four seasons. It, here's the whole conference. So Comcast took over NBC. NBC owned Sci-Fi. Sci-Fi was put on hold before they, like, they weren't allowed to renew any series. So that happened. At the same time, our studio came up for rent. Like our lease was up, but the guy wanted us to sign for another three years. The people who were financing us were like, well, we don't even know if the show's gonna get picked up because Sci-Fi can't make a decision because Comcast is doing this. And the studio guy was like, well, if you're not gonna pay me, get the hell out. And we tried to get an extension and no. And so we were losing the studio. Sci-Fi wasn't able to make a decision. Our financers, who had sunk a ton of money into the show and who were starting to see their money come back, but they basically gap financed the entire series. So when you're looking at $2 million an episode and you do 13 episodes a season and they're putting $26 million into your show or 40 million in our second season, it's a big ask, right? So to go to them and say, yeah, but we're really primed for a fifth season. We don't know if we'll get one, but you wanna just rent the studio just in case for three years? It was just, it, it was just a, uh, it was an awful situation that came from all sides. And our financers, you know, w with full respect to them, just went, uh, this seems like a really big risk to sign this big of a lease when we can't get a commitment. And Sci-Fi just couldn't commit. They couldn't. Um, we all would have loved to have done a fifth season. But really, honestly, that's what happened. It came down to all these factors, and we, it was out of our control. And we then literally had 48 hours to get out of the studio. And I was shooting uh, a movie at the time, um, Random Acts of Romance. When, yeah, thanks. It's fun. Uh, when I got the news, I was devastated. And Martin Wood called me, and he said, I'm, I'm in our office. I'm cleaning out your desk. Is there anything else you want? You know, but we couldn't take anything. It's not our property, but I, I was like, you know, grab me a jacket or something. <laughs> Maybe some of the stuff off Helen's desk. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was devastating. And really still, you know, we're, conversations are starting now to see if there's something to be done with the IP because our financers hold the IP. They own it. They own the intellectual property that is Sanctuary, which is why you don't see a lot being done with it. We would love to have released iTunes uh, of um, Andrew Lockington's incredible music. We would have loved to have, yeah. <laughs> done a lot more with the actual IP than we were able to do, but we'll see. The conversations have been started, so we'll see. Yeah. I'm gonna have to wear a wig, now that I look like Sam Carter again, and talk funny. Anyway, thank you for asking. Hi. Hi, Amanda. Hi. Um, I've got a question, but first I have to thank you. Um, I grew up uh, with a mom having MS, and she passed away when I was 12, just the year that Stargate came on TV back in France. And you, as uh, Sam Carter, and as a person, Amanda Tapping, uh, became a um, role model. So thank you for that. Thank and the, you. And I want to become a director because of you. Um, my question is that you 
did acting, you did producing, you are a director. And I'm wondering, like, because you're like such a good um, storyteller visually, um, don't, why don't you write and do something and direct it and act in it? Like, do it all. <laughs> yeah. I, it's so funny. Uh, first of all, thank you. And I'm really sorry about your mom, but thank you so much. Uh, now I'm going to cry. Um, why don't I write? Uh, I write. Uh, I don't write scripts. I write short stories, and I write a lot of poetry. And uh, I've, I don't know. I've been surrounded by really great writers, like the Brad Wrights and the Damien Kindlers, where I go, I could never do that. Um, but I think I should try. You're right. I should. I have a lot of ideas inside my noggin. Um, as long as I stop banging it into things, they might stay in there. Uh, so yeah, I, I should. Thank you. I, okay, I will. <laughs> I actually, it's, I, I am uh, working with a writing partner in San Francisco on a new series, and we are developing it. So um, I don't know what's going to happen with it, but it, it does force me to write, which is good. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, <laughs> hello. Um, I also wanted to say thank you for just, Sam has always been someone that I could look up to for pretty much my entire life. How has that, w was there a point where you realized that you were playing such a strong character that was making such an impact on so many people? And how did that affect or influence you? <laughs> yeah, uh, wow, yeah, thank you. Um, when I started to get letters, when we started to get fan mail uh, to the studio, the majority of the letters I got were from young women talking about the impact of the character, talking about the inspiration of the character. Uh, and I realized then, reading these letters and what people, I mean, the letters w we got were so uh, eloquent and so honest and raw, some of them, about people's lives and what they'd gone through and how this show inspired or this character did this. And so, yeah, you feel the weight of that responsibility. And I felt it that uh, there were certain things that I would, you know, I didn't push back on the writers very much because for the most part they really got it. But there was a few times where I was like, she can't say that. That's silly. Um, when, you know, once the pilot was over and we knew we were continuing as characters, hence the fact that the reproductive organs on the inside instead of the outside line <laughs> happened because that was in the pilot when we were still on tender hooks. But, um, but I think I knew from the top, when I, when I got the audition for Sam Carter, when I read the character, holy wow, I was like, this is, this is a phenomenal character. I've never seen anything like her. She is so strong. She, you know, there was Janeway and there was, you know, Nicole Nichols did great stuff. But this character felt like, because she was so incredibly smart and because she was such a good sh soldier, and I could read it in, in, even just in the scenes they sent for the audition, for the pilot, I was like, oh, oh man, I gotta get this part. And I knew there was something really quite spectacular about her. And the only blowback I did, and, and, and forgive me, because you probably already all heard the story about my first wardrobe fitting. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna uh, put the caveat on it by saying that it wasn't the producers in town that were asking for what I was asked to do. But uh, they were not at all a part of this decision. But I walked into my first wardrobe fitting, and in the wardrobe room was a push-up bra and a really low-cut tank top. And I went, uh, uh, what? And Christina McQuarrie, who did the wardrobe for Stargate throughout the entire series, uh, is an amazing woman. And she came over onto Sanctuary with us. I just love her. But we had only just met. <laughs> And she said, well, this is, they want, they just want you to try this on. And I went, uh, uh, no, oh my God, no. Uh, oh, first of all, I can't pull that off. I, I have never played the sex card. I can't, I, it's not in my vernacular. I'm not comfortable with it. I, no. And I said, secondly, this character, this character, she's so smart. She's so strong. She's such a great, why do I have to show my boobies? No. <laughs> 
And I burst into tears. I was devastated. And I said, you have to tell them that I won't. And if they want to hire another actor, then they should hire somebody else, because I can't do this. I can't do this to this character. She's too perfect. Like, why? Uh, no, please don't make her a sex kitten. Can I please wear what the guys are wearing? And so she phoned upstairs to where our producers were and said, you know, she's really struggling with this option. And I guess the word came down, can she just try it on and we'll just do a Polaroid and send it to MGM? And I said, no, I'm sorry, but I, no, I can't do it. And I was petrified, because I knew that this was a make or break uh, career character for me. Uh, I loved her so fiercely. I loved the show and the concept so fiercely. And then to walk in and see that, I was like, it just makes me heartbroken even telling the story. But so anyway, she phoned back up, and of course, our producers said, no, forget it, then she doesn't have to do it, don't worry about it. This is one guy at MGM that wants to see her in this outfit, no. <laughs> and so she handed me the black t-shirt, and the regular jacket, and the regular army pants, and the regular boots, and the regular, 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 and said, okay, and I put it on, and I said, wow, I look really frumpy. <laughs> <laughs> in my head. But I was like, this is what? she looks like, and I put it on, and it instantly felt right and comfortable and appropriate, and honoring our military, and honoring the women in the military, and not uh, sexualizing something that needn't be sexualized. Carter stood on her own as an incredibly strong, incredibly intelligent character with great loyalty and so many wonderful redeeming qualities, and she was sexy in her own right by being all of those things, and so I was really, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but I tell you what, I, I was petrified. I was petrified. And even after the wardrobe fitting, I went and had, like, um, they chopped all my hair off, and I went to Jan Newman, who's our makeup artist, who, you know, became Mama Jan. And I was sobbing in the trailer. I was like, I think I might be fired. I think I'm pretty sure I might be fired. I'm pretty thinking sure I might be. <laughs> Then I wasn't, then it was all good. <laughs> yeah, so she's, yeah. She's a seminal character in my career, for sure. Yeah. So I take the responsibility of her legacy and what she represented very seriously. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. 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 Um, so this is kind of similar to the last question. But I was wondering if you knew how much you've inspired girls like me to start studying science. I mean, I found an astrophysics book at my library, and I've been carrying it around and reading it. And <laughs> I've... Um, <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and I'm wondering if, if, you, if you saw that in the character that she was not only going to inspire young women to be, to be strong and to be themselves, but also to be scientists. I am I, aware of, uh, and even more so now, um, of that, thank you so much for your question, an awesome you, smarty, it's great. Uh, I think the world, the paradigm has shifted a lot. I don't think Carter had, uh, you know, she wasn't, she was part of that paradigm shift where women were getting more involved in STEM and in, uh, in all the, the disciplines. Uh, I was just aware that this character was influencing the people who were watching it. And because we ran for so long, 10 seasons, and uh, girls were growing up watching her, that yeah, I was aware. And I'm super proud of that legacy. But that legacy is down to men like Brad Wright, who created and stood by and protected and furthered uh, these kind of characters and kept Sam Carter strong. You know, even in the moments when she was weak, he allowed her strength. And so, uh, you know, I, I, to the great uh, master that is Brad Wright is uh, a huge influence on it. Some of us have a flight to catch and she promised me a selfie. Thank you. 
He's such a nice guy. I love. All my boys are here. Come sit, my darling. I've been waiting. I've been waiting 10 years for this. Huh? I love this woman. I love this woman. I was directing this uh, Hallmark MOW, and you came by with a I card. Live. He lived across the street from where I was directing, and you came by with this Stargate trading card. It was so cute. It was so sweet. I lived next door, and I asked, I said, what is, what, is somebody filming up there? And, uh, and oh. I lived next door to where Amanda was uh, uh, filming, and, and I'm like, what? And I saw her walk in the building. I'm like, what, really? And so I said, listen, I, I know her, you know, I'm going to go up. And I had a trading card um, that uh, was on my kitchen table. So I just grabbed it and I, and I went up and I surprised her. I, she, was, she was in the middle of a directing a scene and I'm just like, I go behind and I'm just like, and then we had a big hug. It was so great. It was so great. I just, before we get back to this lovely, I just want to say one thing. Yesterday in the panel, some lovely lady talked about the scene that, uh, right? You, you were here? Yeah, yeah. That, uh, that Barrett and Carter, uh, the, the building, uh, the house was going to explode. And we, and, right? You remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, the, and the lady would say, well, you know, Amanda, she talked about that. And, and she said, you know, she had a, had a hurt nose and everything. You know, what was your experience with it? And I just thought about it for a second. I'm like, you know what? I landed. I landed on top of this woman. And that was the best no, 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 no. That, that was the best thing that ever happened to my character. And I'm sure somebody said cut, but I didn't hear it. And I looked down at Amanda, and she just has that look. It's like, okay, it's, it's time. It's, it's time. I think you should go. But, I think they said this cut word. Thank. But that's when it started. I wanted to come out and say hi to everybody and give this lovely woman a kiss. I'll let you get back to her. We're such a family. It makes me cry so much to see all the boys I've kissed. <laughs> um, getting all teary, damn it. Uh, that's the beauty of this, and that's why, uh, you know, 21 years after we started making this show, we're all gathered in this room to celebrate a show that um, had a really positive message that was forward thinking that didn't take itself too seriously. So there was a great sense of joy about Stargate uh, in the filming of it and in the telling of our stories um, and a great joy and friendship and love for each other and what we were doing that 21 years later is still as strong as it was the day we started. And that's, uh, that's I think, why we're all here, why we're all here. So, um, and for your love to the show and for your love of each other, and of us and back at you, it's just really quite remarkable. It's very special. <laughs> That's why I'm crying. <laughs> oh, I'm, I, I'm supposed to do this, right? Am I supposed to do this now? I'm supposed, oh, oh. Maybe, there's, maybe there's something attached. This autographed t-shirt is one that has been used in a scene where Carter has been shot. Which one? <laughs> Donated by Claire Cowan. Thank you, Claire. So, okay, let me, let me just, is this a knock? Oh, that was a hard hit. Yeah, that was a really hard hit. Okay, so this shirt. <laughs> this shirt? I wouldn't wear it in public. It might be a bit revealing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, okay, so what I'm supposed to do is throw this Stargate Command pillow. I don't I'd like to keep this pillow. Uh, I'm supposed to toss this into the audience. 
and turn my back, and you guys are supposed to toss it back and forth, and I'm gonna say toss it to the left, and then toss it to the right. I so wanna say stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight. <laughs> but I'm not, that's not what I'm supposed to say. I'm supposed to say, and now just back to the middle, and back to the left, and then I'm gonna have my back turned, and then I'm gonna say stop. And he was ever holding the pillow, so no hogging of the pillow. Because this is live streamed, so people around the world will know that you're being goofy. Is a good word for it. Uh, and then whoever, whenever I say stop, whoever's holding the pillow gets the t-shirt. How cool is that? I feel, <laughs> I feel like I'm at like a sporting event. Like I should have an air gun, a cannon, like t-shirt cannon thing. But I don't, so I just have the pillow. And I really hope I don't hurt anyone when I throw this. But I'm going to use my right hand because I'm right-handed. Okay, ready? Okay, I'm not looking. Oh, I kind of can see you. Uh, throw it to the, uh, to the left. <laughs> to the left, to the left, to the left, to the left. <laughs> throw, it, throw it back, throw it back in the audience, back in the audience, back in the audience. <laughs> now, uh, throw it forward and uh, throw it to the right. And, and back to the left. And throw it forward. And uh, say hi to your neighbor. Hi, neighbor. And now throw it back. And throw it to the, this is my right hand. And throw it forward. And then throw it to the left. And then stop. Wow. I thought it was over there. I don't know where, wow. Here. There you go. Thank you, and you can thank Claire Cowan. She's the one who donated it. Congratulations. Cool, thanks Claire. Right on. <laughs> don't wear it in public. Well, you could probably get away with it because you don't have boobies, but <laughs> if you did, it would be awkward. Oh, wow, I said that out loud. Uh, live stream, too. I said boobies. Boobies. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, this is real as it gets, folks. <laughs> I've had two cups of tea. Uh, okay, yes, hi. Um, actually, greetings from the Tolka High Council. Hello, beautiful <laughs> costume. Um, I, I was wondering, because you, you know, the Carter, of course, had uh, such, such a wonderful balance between power, intelligence, and, well, let's just call it adorability. Uh, I like adorability. Yeah, it, and it, it, was, it was more than just feminine, it was adorable. And, and, but did you consciously balance those, other than the time you said, I'm not wearing that? <laughs> right. Uh, or, 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 did, or did you just, or is that just natural for you? I think that that's just how she came to be played. I mean, there was moments where I really wanted to be strong and moments where the intelligence and the, you know, the techno babble and the understanding of the techno babble was super important. Uh, but otherwise, it was just how she developed. And then, I mean, you know, you infuse a lot of yourself into characters, which is where you get the a dork ability. Because <laughs> uh, I am quite a dork. Uh, but yeah, it just, it's just... It's sort of a natural progression in certain things. That, you know, every season, because we went for so long, there were season five minutes. Oh, golly. Yep, there you go. Uh, every season, I would try to find something for Carter. Where are you going? I'm still talking. I don't, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. It's okay. It's okay. No, it's not. <laughs> Banned for life. Uh, but there were times at the beginning of every season where I would try to find a new way into Carter because it became so easy that you didn't want to fall into this level of complacency where it was just like, say the words, blah, blah, blah. So there were, th <laughs> it sounds really crazy, but you know, I remember, I think it was the beginning of season six, I was like, I got to find her walk again because it's becoming too Amanda. How does somebody walk in army boots when they're carrying a gun and, you know, the physicality of that. And I would restudy uh, Stephen Hawkins and astrophysics and I would re try to reassociate, you know, what the passion for that. And so uh, there was always something. There was always something to be done to help lift her uh, because she was so great. And I loved, loved 
loved Sam Carter, and I didn't want to ever not do her justice. But, you know, the dorkiness is pure me, <laughs> for better or worse. Hi. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, uh, after uh, Stargate Universe, it didn't continue. I was just wondering what your thoughts on Sam's career uh, professional uh, advancement would be. Would it be taking over for home homeworld security or possibly president or or whatever? I never thought of president. <laughs> she would actually make an awesome president. Wouldn't she? I mean, there are those that might disagree, and that's okay, uh, which is why I tend not to get into political discourse on social media, because I believe everyone has a right to an opinion. I have a very strong political opinion. I just don't think everyone needs to hear it all the time. But having said that, I think she'd be a really great president, especially right now. <laughs> Um, but I always thought that Sam would eventually become uh, the head of Stargate Command. It's my, in my mind, you know. Or maybe they just send her adrift in the General Hammond ship and she, you know, where'd she go? I don't know, I haven't heard from her in a while. <laughs> uh, but I was, yeah, I always thought that she would end up at Stargate Command and be like super bummed out about it because she'd want to go on all the missions still, but yeah. I always pictured her as the head of Stargate Command, eventually. Yeah. I think I've told this story before, but I jokingly once said, and then she would go home to the cabin and Jack would have dinner ready for her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So either that or president. I don't know. <laughs> Both. Both. Yeah. Can you imagine Jack as the first lady? <laughs> That would be so, he would be, that would be funny. <laughs> he would be so inappropriate. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we could just go on with that, that line of, I can take that for miles, that's great. Great question, thank you. Hi. On that line, it sounds like you have a, a new script to write. <laughs> So my question, uh, in, in line to some of the things we've already heard, is that uh, children experience, as childhood experiences, direct our lives sometimes with interest. How did you pull some of your experiences from your childhood and your interest into Sam and into Helen and your interest in science fiction and science and that compassion? It's something you don't often see mm. in a character. Um, well, first of all, my childhood, I grew up with three brothers. And I think that informed a lot of who I, Amanda, am, and how much easier it was for Sam and for me to play Sam on a team with three boys, men. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and a little stupid little aside, and you probably already heard it, but my whole life, my dad called me Sam because uh, he wanted me to be called Samantha when I was born, and he lost the fight with my mom. So I was called Amanda, but my dad, in, in defiance, called me Sam. To this day, he calls and says, hey, Sam, how you doing? Uh, and my brothers are Richard, Christopher, and Stephen, and I had a stepbrother named Michael, and I ended up working <laughs> with Richard, Christopher, and Michael, right? So it was fate, destiny, all of the above. Um, <clears throat> so my childhood very much informed my ability to be around guys and be comfortable and not, uh, I was never allowed to be super feminine. It just wasn't part of our household. We were outdoorsy and camping and three boys. So it, that helped a lot. Um, I honestly did not love science fiction when I was a kid. I loved Little House on the Prairie. Um, but, you know, Laura in her way was a plucky little half pint too, right? She was a pretty cool character. Um, but then um, I started to watch it with my brothers. I started to watch Babylon 5, and then I watched um, the next gen Star Trek Next Generation, and I got, really got into that. And then I developed this love for that genre, and then, of course, I got Stargate and went, oh, my gosh, and then realized how far-reaching the genre is. And that was really on Stargate that I truly developed a passion for science fiction. 
because of that show, because of what we were doing and exploring and talking to actors on other shows and, you know, just the themes that you can explore um, while still keeping it real, I thought was fantastic. So that informed. Um, but yeah, I think probably the biggest thing that informed Sam Carter was Amanda growing up with three brothers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I learned how to punch. And I can throw a football and make it spiral. Like, I can, I can throw a good football. Yeah. Which I think was important for Sam somewhere. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I just first want to say that you are so awesome and that you are powerful, not just your character. And I wanted to ask um, if you have any advice that you would give to young aspiring actresses or actors and what that may be. You know, it's, it's going to sound a li little by rote, but you just have to keep trying. It's a really crappy business at times and it's heartbreaking and it can be soul sucking going to audition after audition after audition after audition and waiting for the phone to ring and not knowing what the feedback is. But if you have a passion for it and you love the creative process, you have to keep doing it. Otherwise you'll never be fulfilled in life if you don't feed that passion. So I would say keep pursuing. I was a reader for auditions way, way back in the day in Toronto when I was a young actor. And I would encourage you to do that if you can work with a casting director and watch people audition. But I also realized, being a reader, how arbitrary the casting decisions can sometimes be. The best actress may come up for a part, do an amazing audition, walk out of the room, everyone goes, whoa, she was great. And the director goes, yeah, she reminds me of my ex-girlfriend now. <laughs> Happened, true story. And it was like, but she was amazing, uh, oh wow, that's really why she didn't get the part? And she walked out never knowing why she didn't get the part, thinking she didn't do a good audition. Turns out it was something arbitrary. Yeah, I was thinking of a brunette, not a blonde. Oh, you know, stupid stuff like that. So know when you leave an audition room that there are a million different factors that go into the decision that really sometimes have nothing to do with how well you auditioned. Um, but keep doing it. Get on stage. Get on stage and feed that incredible passion. Because um, that's where the joy, there's so much joy in that. And you really are live in front of people. And it's an amazing, amazing stomping ground and training ground. Good luck to you. Thank you. Hi. Hi there. Hi. Uh, you were talking about your career in your introduction a little bit, moving from actor. And you're saying now you're mostly a director and producer. Um, what's new now? What, you know, your experience has to change and you're still doing it and I assume given your energy you're really still into it and excited about it. Yeah. What's new and surprising and, and uh, maybe something you wouldn't have expected as you moved this way in your career? Uh, well, for me personally, I think, because now I've, I, I think I've directed about 50 episodes of television and so What's new, what's, what I'm finding great joy in is uh, the technical aspect of it. I've always liked the technical aspect of filmmaking and of television, but to actually really now dive into what each lens does or how to really you know, manipulate a techno crane or how to create a visual context for a scene and like all of that the stuff that you learn about axis and about blocking. For me now, it's like I know that basic stuff and I know my technical stuff, so now I can sort of, I'm enjoying the process of taking it to the next level and challenging, saying, hey, what if we shoot this at 60 frames per second at a 180 degree shutter? Can we do that? How about we do this? How about we do, f you know? And, and that may mean nothing to you, but to me now I understand what that means and it's actually cool. So I love that. Um, the technology is changing, the cameras change almost yearly. It feels like there's a new, a new camera that everyone wants to use. Um, but the basic storytelling has stayed the same. The basic idea of telling stories has stayed the same. And so for me, it's just, I don't know if I'm answering your question well, but just feeding that, that creative passion. Um, and I find that I love, uh, I'm more confident now than I was when I started working with actors, which is ironic because I came from that side, but I'm more confident with giving them direction because I now see so much from the other side. 
Yeah. So, I don't know. I, there's always room for growth. I always, every single show, I learn something. Every show. Every show. Oh, get in, eh? Mm. Uh, g'day, mate. I'm evil. You are. The axis of evil <laughs> steps onto the stage at GateCon. The invasion. Hi, would you like me to leave? Um, well... <laughs> there's your answer. <laughs> but, unfortunately... I have to be somewhere. You have to be somewhere, and other people have to be other places Yeah, there's other stuff. people that want to come up on stage <laughs> and talk to you. For sure, right? Yeah. Like, so, like this guy. <laughs> We're your bodyguards. Hi. Say hi to Jacob. Jacob. Hi. Hi, buddy. Oh my god. Oh my god. My daughter's thirteen. What? We are bodyguards. So much to catch up on. <laughs> Yeah, please. Please, you look so good. I'm so excited. You look so good, yeah. That's a sehr good. Smell it. Uh, I'm so scared to go in the woods now. You said something about a candy house. Oh, God. And my dog has disappeared. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's a little reunion. <laughs> Hi. Okay, so I gotta go. Ladies and gentlemen. Oh, she's gotta go. Damn it. Alex, what the what? 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 That's pretty awesome. What is it? The first game I ever, the Dutchies gave me this shirt with a little Mike. 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 You got a big voice. <laughs> Hello. Anyway, the Dutchies gave me this, uh, the Dutchies fangirls gave me this at the first GateCon ever. And it's a little, like the earth symbol with a little, uh, you know, Dutch girl hat and a little tulip, you know, so. I've had it for all these years. Thank you. Thank you, Dutchies. That's so nice. It's very nice. And we were just saying we were Amanda's bodyguards to get her past, you know, off the tip. No, just kidding. <laughs> okay, come on. Ladies Let's and go. gentlemen, a Did huge round of applause, please, for Amanda Thank Tapping. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good to see ya. Here, 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 here. I'll stand. Thanks, guys. Don't bring another chair, but I'm good. <laughs>